The Murderer's Violin, Erkman Chatrian. Karl Hafitz had spent six years in mastering counterpoint. He had studied Haydn, Gluck, Mozart, Beethoven, and Rossini. He enjoyed capital health and was possessed of ample means which permitted him to indulge his artistic tastes. In a word, he possessed all that goes to make up the grand and beautiful in music, except that insignificant but very necessary thing, inspiration. Every day, fired with a noble ardor, he carried to his worthy instructor, Albertus Kilian, long pieces harmonious enough, but of which every phrase was cribbed. His master, Albertus, seated in his armchair, his feet on the fender, his elbow on a corner of the table, smoking his pipe all the time, set himself to erase, one after the other, the singular discoveries of his pupil. Carl cried with rage. He got very angry and disputed the point, but the old master quietly opened one of his numerous music books, and, putting his finger on the passage, said, Look there, my boy. Then Carl bowed his head and despaired of the future. But one fine morning, when he had presented to his master as his own composition a fantasia of Boccherini, varied with Viotti, the good man could no longer remain silent. Carl, he exclaimed, do you take me for a fool? Do you think that I cannot detect your larcenies? This is really too bad. And then, perceiving the consternation of his pupil, he added, Listen, I am willing to believe that your memory is to blame, and that you mistake recollection for originality. But you are growing too fat, decidedly. You drink too generous a wine, and above all, too much beer. That is what is shutting up the avenues of your intellect. You must get thinner. Get thinner? Yes, or give up music. You do not lack science, but ideas, and it is very simple. If you pass your whole life covering the strings of your violin with a coat of grease, how can they vibrate? These words penetrated the depths of Hoffitz's soul. If it is necessary for me to get thin, exclaimed he, I will not shrink from any sacrifice. Since matter oppresses the mind, I will starve myself. His countenance wore such an expression of heroism at that moment that Albertus was touched. He embraced his pupil and wished him every success. The very next day, Karl Hoffitz, knapsack on his back and baton in hand, left the Hotel of the Three Pigeons and the brewery sacred to King Gambrinus and set out upon his travels. He proceeded towards Switzerland. Unfortunately, at the end of six weeks he was much thinner, but inspiration did not come any more readily for that. Can anyone be more unhappy than I am, he said. Neither fasting nor good cheer, nor water, wine, or beer can bring me up to the necessary pitch. What have I done to deserve this? While a crowd of ignorant people produce remarkable works, I, with all my science, all my application, all my courage, cannot accomplish anything. Ah, heaven is not good to me. It is unjust. Communing thus with himself, he took the road from Brook to Freiburg. Night was coming on. He felt weary and footsore. Just then he perceived by the light of the moon an old ruined inn, half hidden in trees on the opposite side of the way. The door was off its hinges. The small window panes were broken. The chimney was in ruins. Nettles and briars grew around it in wild luxuriance, and the garret windows scarcely topped the heather, in which the wind blew hard enough to take the horns off a cow. Carl could also perceive through the mist that a branch of a fir tree waved above the door. Well, he muttered, the inn is not prepossessing. It is rather ill-looking indeed, but we must not judge by appearances. So, without hesitation, he knocked at the door with his stick. "'Who is there? What do you want?' called out a rough voice within. "'Shelter and food,' replied the traveler. "'Ah, very good.' The door opened suddenly, and Carl found himself confronted by a stout personage with square visage, gray eyes, 
his shoulders covered with a greatcoat loosely thrown over them, and carrying an axe in his hand. Behind this individual, a fire was burning on the hearth, which lighted up the entrance to a small room and the wooden staircase, and close to the flame was crouched a pale young girl clad in a miserable brown dress with little white spots on it. She looked towards the door with an affrighted air. Her black eyes had something sad and an indescribably wandering expression in them. Carl took all this in at a glance and instinctively grasped his stick tighter. Well, come in, said the man. This is no time to keep people out of doors. Then Carl, thinking it bad form to appear alarmed, came into the room and sat down by the hearth. Give me your knapsack and stick, said the man. For the moment, the pupil of Albertus trembled to his very marrow, but the knapsack was unbuckled and the stick placed in the corner, and the host was seated quietly before the fire ere he had recovered himself. This circumstance gave him confidence. Landlord, said he, smiling, I am greatly in want of my supper. What would you like for supper, sir? asked the landlord. An omelet, some wine and cheese. Ha, ha, you have got an excellent appetite, but our provisions are exhausted. You have no cheese, then? No. No butter, nor bread, nor milk? No. Well, good heavens, what have you got? We can roast some potatoes in the embers. Just then, Carl caught sight of a whole regiment of hens perched on the staircase in the gloom of all sorts, in all attitudes, some pluming themselves in the most nonchalant manner. But, said Hoffitz, pointing at this troop of fowls, you must have some eggs, surely? We took them all to market this morning. Well, if the worst comes to the worst, you can roast a fowl for me. Scarcely had he spoken when the pale girl, with disheveled hair, darted to the staircase, crying, No one shall touch the fowls! No one shall touch my fowls! Ho, ho, ho! God's creatures must be respected! Her appearance was so terrible that Hoffitz hastened to say, No, no, the fowls shall not be touched. Let us have the potatoes. I devote myself to eating potatoes henceforth. From this moment my object in life is determined. I shall remain here three months, six months, any time that may be necessary to make me as thin as a faker. He expressed himself with such animation that the host cried out to the girl, Geno Fefa, Geno Fefa, look! The spirit has taken possession of him, just as the other was. The north wind blew more fiercely outside. The fire blazed up on the hearth and puffed great masses of gray smoke up to the ceiling. The hens appeared to dance in the reflection of the flame, while the demented girl sang in a shrill voice a wild air, and the log of green wood, hissing in the midst of the fire, accompanied her with its plaintive sibilations. Hoffitz began to fancy that he had fallen upon the den of the sorcerer Hecker. He devoured a dozen potatoes and drank a great draft of cold water. Then he felt somewhat calmer. He noticed that the girl had left the chamber, and that only the man sat opposite to him by the hearth. Landlord, he said, show me where I am to sleep. The host lit a lamp and slowly ascended the worm-eaten staircase. He opened a heavy trapdoor with his gray head and led Carl to a loft beneath the thatch. There is your bed, he said, as he deposited the lamp on the floor. Sleep well, and above all things beware of fire. He then descended, and Hoffitz was left alone, stooping beneath the low roof in front of a great mattress covered with a sack of feathers. He considered for a few seconds whether it would be prudent to sleep in such a place, for the man's countenance did not appear very prepossessing, particularly as, recalling his cold gray eyes, his blue lips, his wide bony forehead, his yellow hue, he suddenly recalled to mind that on the Goldsenberg he had encountered three men hanging in chains, and that one of them bore a striking resemblance to the landlord. 
that he had also those grave eyes, the bony elbows, and that the great toe of his left foot protruded from his shoe, cracked by the rain. He also recollected that that unhappy man named Melchior had been a musician formerly, and that he had been hanged for having murdered the landlord of the golden sheep with his pitcher, because he had asked him to pay his scanty reckoning. This poor fellow's music had affected him powerfully in former days. It was fantastic, and the pupil of Albertus had envied the Bohemian. But just now, when he recalled the figure on the gibbet, his tatters agitated by the night wind, and the ravens wheeling around him with discordant screams, he trembled violently, and his fears augmented when he discovered, at the farther end of the loft against the wall, a violin decorated with two faded palm leaves. Then, indeed, he was anxious to escape. But at that moment he heard the rough voice of the landlord. "'Put out that light, will you?' he cried. "'Go to bed. I told you particularly to be cautious about fire.' These words froze Carl. He threw himself upon the mattress and extinguished the light. Silence fell on all the house. Now, notwithstanding his determination not to close his eyes— Hoffitz, in consequence of hearing the sighing of the wind, the cries of the night birds, the sound of the mice pattering over the floor, towards one o'clock fell asleep. But he was awakened by a bitter, deep, and most distressing sob. He started up, a cold perspiration standing on his forehead. He looked up and saw crouched up beneath the angle of the roof a man. It was Melchior the executed criminal. His hair fell down to his emaciated ribs. His chest and neck were naked. One might compare him to a skeleton of an immense grasshopper, so thin was he. A ray of moonlight entering through the narrow window gave him a ghastly blue tint, and all around him hung the long webs of spiders. Hoffitz, speechless, with staring eyes and gaping mouth, kept gazing at this weird object, as one might be expected to gaze at death standing at one's bedside when the last hour has come. Suddenly the skeleton extended its long, bony hand, and took the violin from the wall, placed it in position against its shoulder, and began to play. There was in this ghostly music something of the cadence with which the earth falls upon the coffin of a dearly loved friend. Something solemn as the thunder of the waterfall echoed afar by the surrounding rocks, majestic as the wild blasts of the autumn tempest in the midst of the sonorous forest trees. Sometimes it was sad, sad as never-ending despair. Then, in the midst of all this, he would strike into a lively measure, persuasive, silvery as the notes of a flock of goldfinches fluttering from twig to twig. These pleasing trills soared up with an ineffable tremolo of careless happiness, only to take flight all at once, frightened away by the waltz, foolish, palpitating, bewildering, love, joy, despair, all together singing, weeping, hurrying pell-mell over the quivering strings. And Carl, notwithstanding his extreme terror, extended his arms and exclaimed, Oh, great, great artist! Oh, sublime genius! Oh, how I lament your sad fate, to be hanged for having murdered that brute of an innkeeper who did not know a note of music, to wander through the forest by moonlight, never to live in the world again, and with such talents! Oh, heaven! But as he thus cried out, he was interrupted by the rough tones of his host. Hello up there. Will you be quiet? Are you ill, or is the house on fire? Heavy steps ascended the staircase. A bright light shone through the chinks of the door, which was opened by a thrust of the shoulder, and the landlord appeared. Oh, exclaimed Hoffitz, what things happen here? First I am awakened by celestial music and entranced by heavenly strains, and then it all vanishes as if it were but a dream. The innkeeper's face assumed a thoughtful expression. Yes, yes, he muttered. I might have thought as much. 
Melchior has come to disturb your rest. He will always come. Now we have lost our night's sleep. It is no use to think of rest any more. Come along, friend. Get up and smoke a pipe with me. Carl waited no second bidding. He hastily left the room. But when he got downstairs, seeing that it was still dark night, he buried his head in his hands and remained for a long time plunged in melancholy meditation. The host relighted the fire, and taking up his position in the opposite corner of the hearth, smoked in silence. At length the gray dawn appeared through the little diamond-shaped panes. Then the cock crew, and the hens began to hop down from step to step of the staircase. "'How much do I owe you?' asked Carl, as he buckled on his knapsack and resumed his walking staff. "'You owe us a prayer at the chapel of St. Blaise,' said the man, with a curious emphasis. "'One prayer for the soul of Melchior, who was hanged, "'and another for his fiancée, Genofefa, the poor idiot.' Is that all? That is all. Well, then, goodbye. I shall not forget. And, indeed, the first thing that Carl did on his arrival at Freiburg was to offer up a prayer for the poor man and for the girl he had loved, and then he went to the Grape Hotel, spread his sheet of paper upon the table, and, fortified by a bottle of Ricavir, he wrote at the top of the page the murderer's violin, and then on the spot he traced the score of his first original composition. <laughs>